very often I get the question, where do you get all your energy from? And every time I get this question, I feel very flattered. I really like being someone who people look at and say, where does he get all his energy from? And I believe a big part of where I get my energy from is how I'm eating. And about two, maybe three years ago, I completely changed my diet. And a lot of that happened thanks to Emil. And his research and his, to me, crazy ideas, who I just applied into my life without really understanding them. We spoke about some of these in the last episode about why I have butter and coconut oil in my coffee and what kind of fats I should avoid and shouldn't avoid and why I'm not eating for 16 hours per day quite frequently and fasting, why that's good for me. And I didn't know these things. So if you want, you can go and check out that episode. And today we'll keep digging into habits that I've learned are very, very good for entrepreneurs who want to have energy, who want to be focused, who want to jump out of bed in the morning and to look good and be smart and be creative. All of that comes from habits and a lot of it comes from food. And I'm here with Emil today, who was the first person joining me in Great.com and who has been researching this topic a lot and is not a scientist, but he could be a weird scientist in long comic, evil genius guy. Very digging, diving deeply into this topic and who I always get inspired by and feel trust towards when he tells me new health things. And today we'll start, we'll keep exploring these different things. So Emil, how are you feeling? Thank you, Eric. First, I would say that I would call myself a life scientist. A life scientist, With a disclaimer that I'm not a real scientist. (laughs) (laughs) Today I feel calm, focused, quite energized, tired in my body, but clear in my head. I had a lot of fun recording the last episode, so I am excited to jump back in. And I am here with Eric Bergman, who is the founder of Great.com. He's a serial entrepreneur, a very energized, outgoing, social guy, a very good friend of mine, and someone that I would like to see live for a very, very long time and make this project into a monolith monolith that's a hard word it's a big 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 thing that will stand for a long time like a pyramid or great.com i can see that thank you and this is the becoming great podcast a podcast that we do because we believe that entrepreneurship is the way to make the world a better place and this is for you who share that vision with us and want to learn more about entrepreneurship and more about making the world a better place And we do all of our episodes in four different formats, one of which is about great.com and the project that we're doing. One of them is about life hacks, health and relationships, all kinds of things that relates to how to improve your life. And this is one of those specific episodes. The other two kinds of episodes we do is about me and my journey and stories that I have to tell and that I've learned. And the fourth kind is entrepreneurship, how to be a better businessman, how to run a company, how to start something, how to be a better leader. And let's just dive into this episode of health, because something that I'm very curious of is sugar. I know that everyone says that sugar is bad for us. I've heard that since the first time I probably understood what sugar was. But I have actually no idea why sugar is bad for me. Why, why is sugar bad for me, Emil? Well, not everyone is saying that. I remember I was at my grandma's place and I said, uh, I will only have one cookie, please. Of every kind, of course. <laughs> because I'm a little bit sensitive to sugar. And she said, oh no, you poor thing. There gotta be such a life disadvantage. <laughs> so it's, it's a quite new thing the understanding how sugar affects the body. That's interesting. 
I, when so when I picture you telling this story, I see seven year old Emil sitting there with glasses, looking up at my grandmother. And, Please don't force feed me cookies. Was that how it happened? I was twenty seven. <laughs> so tw- <laughs> twenty years later. Back then, I loved cookies. My favorite thing ever was when you got a mm, meringue bag. I have no idea what that is called in English. No, it's idea. basically the, a mountain of sugar, and that was my favorite thing. <laughs> I guess it, I used to go to McDonald's and uh, steal. We can call it borrow uh, sugar packages that was meant for the coffee. Mm. I just took two full yum, hands yum, yum, of yum. sugar packages, put them in my pocket, and that became my little snack. Yum 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 yum. Lovely. And and obviously that was really good for me. Yeah, totally <laughs> good for your mood. <laughs> Okay, so in my understanding today, sugar is bad for me. Even if grandmothers don't understand it, even if Eric stealing sugar from McDonald's don't really understand it, I still don't understand why it's good for me. I've just heard it and then I avoid it. So please educate me. Why? What happens when I eat sugar? So may I start with what do you think happens? What is your experience of eating sugar compared to when you don't? I don't know. I haven't given it much thought. I haven't felt into it that much. I don't know. I've only heard that your blood blood sugar goes up or down. I don't know what that means. I personally, I can't really relate to that. I'm feeling so differently from eating this or that. And I think that's because I, I shift I shift the way I've eaten over such a long time that I probably don't remember what energy level I used to have when I ate more sugar. I can't, it's kind of like, I imagine it being when you see your kid grow. I don't have a kid, so I can't say that. But that you don't, you can't see it yourself because I see it every day. I feel my body every day. So I don't really feel different from when I used to eat sugar. I used to drink Coke every day and now I don't. And I can't say that I'm feeling a difference. I'm just... I think there is a difference. So may I be your parent here and say what kind of happened in the last two years? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we spoke in the last episode about I started to introduce these ideas to you when we were on a trip in Africa. And I remember, and I was a little bit making fun of or questioning Eric for eating the food that he did. And I remember at least at four different occasions where Eric had a blood sugar crash that was so intense that he couldn't speak to someone. He couldn't think. He was just sitting back in the car being super grumpy and saying, I need a banana right now. <laughs> and we had to run it, find a gas station to get Eric a banana. Mm, that makes sense. So that's what happens when I eat sugar. Yes. Okay, so take me through this process then. Why did that happen? Okay, so you have... I'm going to see if I can explain this in a simple way. Imagine you have two gas tanks in your car. One big one, that is your fat gas tank. All the fat that is stored on your body. You have probably a month supply of energy there. And then you have a small glass ta- uh, gas tank where that is stored in your muscle and in your liver in the form of glycogen. Let's call that your blood sugar. So that's your small tank. And when you eat carbohydrates when that is present in your system, you only have access to the small tank. And once when you have depleted that and not eaten carbohydrates for a while, you get access to the big tank. And if you get out of fuel in the small tank, you will be Eric in the back seat of the car, really needing a banana right now. Okay, so I'll see if I can paraphrase this and teach this back. We, we have two energy reserves one which is whatever food we've just eaten which is stored in our stomach and our liver and one which is the big energy reserve that covers our body in various places with fats and the fat version is made for us we we store it there because at some point we might run out of food and we might need it but it's not really an easy transition to go from using the fat in the small, well, using the energy in the small tank to using the energy in the big tank. So if we take this to a car analogy, 
and it has two gas tanks. When it runs out in the small tank, it can't seamlessly jump over to the big tank. It would like <coughs> cough a lot and go weirdly and be feeling like a grumpy car until it actually could start accessing the big tank. Exactly. And the reason, well, one reason for that is that when you get a big spike of sugar in your blood, your body sends out a hormone that is called insulin. And insulin now takes the sugar from your blood and stores it into fat cells. So this is a fat storage hormone. And when that is present in your body, you can't get access to the energy that is in your fat cells. Why? Because the, to my understanding, and I'm not sure of this, is because the insulin prevents that. So you okay, need to so be, if, if I'm yeah. eating sugar, my body starts producing insulin that wants to turn that sugar into a fat reserve. And maybe, not being any scientist in this, we can't access the fat reserves at the same time as we're trying to produce the fat reserves. Exactly. And that puts us in a situation where our energy crashes quickly because at some point we run out of that energy we have just eaten, but we're not able to access the other reserves because we're in a process where we try to build that reserve rather than access that reserve. Exactly. So now you want to counter that by eating more sugar. I need yeah. a banana right now. And here we get into a loop of... We keep eating sugar often and often and often. And this is not a natural thing for us. If we looked at the hunter and gatherer version of humans, we might found some honey here and there. We might found some really delicious sweet fruit, although that fruit would have had fiber in it. So we were not exposed to these blood sugar spikes that often. And it kind of makes sense, right? You found some fruit in the summer. Your body says, ah, great. We store this on the body for the winter. But now in our society, we're in a state where the average American drinks half a liter of Coca-Cola each day. So we always have this store for the winter thing going on, which causes the body to release insulin. And yes. How much sugar is half a liter Coca-Cola? Um, one cola, I think, is 10% sugar. So what's that? 50 grams. 50 grams, yeah. So how so- many bananas would that be? I don't know the answer to that, uh, but a banana bananas. has a little bit of um, fiber in it, depending, like if it's green, it has more fiber. And then when it gets yellow or rotten. Okay, so let's, let's just put that glass of Coca-Cola into perspective of Eric living 2000 years ago in a cave. How yeah. long would it take for me living a regular life, do you think? And I realize that this is not some scientific data to eat a total of 50 grams of sugar. Do you think that's like a month supply? It's not only how much you eat, because when you eat, if you eat an apple, the apple has fiber in it, and the fiber is causing your body to break down the apple into sugar more slow. So you don't get these crazy spikes, which means that you don't get as much insulin. Yeah, okay, but let's just simplify it and think of it as sugar and sugar uh, and keep one parameter. Do you think it would take me like a month to get uh, 50 grams of sugar? Or is it like a week back in the days? Or what Uh, would you think would be a normal... So I think honey, for example, is pure, um, it's almost only sugar. So then that would be 50 milliliters of honey, right? Yeah. Uh, Am I right? And probably Eric in the cave doesn't access um, honey very often. Well, either way, what... My my just first thought of this is that, okay, one glass of Coca-Cola could be like one month of quote-unquote natural sugar supply if this were 2,000 years ago. It would take a long time to get that amount of sugar otherwise. It would, and it wouldn't have the same effect on your body because of the fibers. Yeah. And to have access to ketosis which is the state where your body is using fat for energy you want to probably keep your carbohydrate intake um, about lower than maybe 20 
20 to 50 grams a day. So already there, you're out of that state. Okay. So no Coke, to sum it up. <laughs> well, what happens if you drink Coke regularly is that you get these blood sugar spices, f- spikes followed by insulin spikes regularly. And when you often have a hormone present, what happens is that your body is starting to become immune to it. You have fewer receptors. I think that is the process for this hormone. So you need more and more insulin to lower your blood sugar. And you create something that is called insulin resistance. And this is what diabetes is. You become resistant to your body's insulin. And now you become sick from sugar. Okay, so let me see if I understand this. When I'm eating sugar, my body produces a hormone called insulin that tries to turn the sugar into fat energy reserves that I can store for later. And if I'm eating a lot of sugar a lot of the time, and especially if I'm having like a glass of Coke, which is like almost pure sugar, my body produces lots of insulin to deal with that and When I'm doing this regularly, after a while, my body doesn't really react to the insulin because it's been producing so much insulin that it's just really unnatural and my body can't really understand how much insulin it has been creating. So after a while, it doesn't then... uh, Well, I'm guessing then the insulin doesn't properly transform the sugar into fat anymore. And that's when we get diabetes. To my understanding, I would summarize it like this. Okay. I'm not, uh, my understanding of diabetes is not that big, but to my understanding, this is the basic mechanism. Okay. So sugar will have an, an impact on my energy level because it will give me quick energy that runs out quickly. And it will have an impact on my mood because it gives me quick energy and it runs out quickly. It doesn't sound like it's that bad for my health. It's more for how I'm feeling, but is it bad for my health as well? Well, diabetes is obviously not a good thing, but other than that. So you're asking for your health? Yeah, like, am I going to get sicker if I'm eating sugar? Am I going to get sick more often? For sure. And why is that? Um, Sugar creates a lot of inflammation. And inflammation is, imagine that you you play, what is your favorite sport? Mm, I don't really have a favorite, Thai boxing. Thai boxing, okay. So... A Interesting kid. how I couldn't find the word Thai boxing because it said play a favorite sport. I don't play Thai boxing. That didn't pop up in my head. Okay, so let's say you fight <laughs> a about... A train Thai boxing. You told me before that you're scared of this 14-year-old kid in Thai boxing. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> haunting Eric in his nightmares. So let's say he hits you really hard. So you start bleeding on your arm. Yeah. Right? Now, when you start bleeding, you will start to get all red and a lot of blood is going to come there. And your body will start to heal. The reason it gets red is inflammation. And when that is local and in response to a cut, that is a very good thing. But what happens when we eat something like sugar, for example? Let's stop there. So inflammation can be a good thing. I I only thought that was a bad thing. I only heard that word being used as a negative thing. It's a good thing when it happens locally. Okay, so inflammation... What is inflammation? It's an immune system response to heal up wounds, for example. Okay, so inflammation is the body reacting to something. It's not something bad happened to the body. It's not like inflammation is not a virus or a bacteria. Inflammation is a protection mechanism then. Exactly. Uh, That's the way I understand it. Okay, so when we get cut our body starts protecting ourselves because we don't want bacteria and viruses and things and we want to heal. Mm. So, okay. So inflammation is basically our immune system getting armed and ready and prepared for war so we can keep any enemies trying to do something away. I'm not 100% certain of uh, of this, but I, to my understanding, this is what is happening. Okay. So what what I do know is that some inflammation is good for you, but chronic inflammation, whole system inflammation 
is correlated to most of the diseases that we see in the the new diseases that we see in the Western world. Like and when all, you say Alzheimer's, chronic, and when you say chronic and whole system inflammation, then you mean basically inflammation going on in our entire body all the time. Exactly. So pretty much that our immune system believes that it's fighting or actually it might be fighting uh, constantly, not just to heal a wound, but there is something going on all the time, which feels, well, I guess that's a very stressful thing for the body to deal with. You could put it like that. Yes, exactly. Okay. Has it something to do with stress? It feels like it's kind of the same thing. Like when we're stressed, we're constantly cautious about... Well, the way I envision stress is like we're constantly just waiting for that tiger to jump and, and kill us. Mm -hmm. But we there is no tigers in today's society. So we're just constantly alert and our body's never fully relaxed. Mm -hmm. And that's a full body kind of thing going on as well. Exactly. That is, you have a constant presence of cortisol and other stress hormones in your body. Okay. So and I yeah. guess it's a two-way street where that leads to inflammation and inflammation leads to stress. Okay. But I'm not sure. But it's kind of similar then in the sense that both stress and inflammation is our body trying to protect us from something which may or may not be there. And it keeps fighting something all the time, which obviously takes a lot of energy from us. Exactly. And back in the old days, you would see a lion run away and then relax. You would get a wound, you get inflamed, it heals up and then it's gone. Although now we have this low level chronic whole systemic uh, presence of this and inflammation is correlated to i think most of the modern diseases that we have like heart disease diabetes alzheimer's okay cancer as well i guess everything relates to cancer oh yeah yeah for sure <laughs> for sure Okay, so and just some... having a lower working immune system in general. So you get more exposed to most diseases. So how does that happen then? How does sugar create inflammation? What, what, what is it that the body is trying to fight with sugar? Mm. That is a very good question, actually. I want to do some research on that. Why exactly it is causing inflammation? I just know that it does. So I would have to get back to you on that one. Okay. Yeah, because that makes... It's interesting to understand that process. Well, what happens that... What is the body trying to protect ourselves from with sugar then? Mm. Or what does the sugar create that the body has to protect ourselves from? That's a very interesting question. How sugar is causing inflammation? I would have to research that. Uh, One thing that happens with sugar is that you have two intestines in your body. You have a smaller one that is on top, and then you have a lower one that is on bottom. When you eat something like uh, kale that has a lot of fiber in it, that goes through your whole intestine. It has fiber that protects it from being broken down by bacteria in the smaller intestine. And it goes all the way to your bigger one, where your friendly, nice guy gut bacteria lives, and they are getting the food. Sugar has no fiber in it, so it gets digested in the small intestine where kind of bad bacteria lives that makes you sick. And nothing, no food comes down to uh, the large intestine where your good gut bacteria is. And the gut bacteria are very much responsible for your immune system and 90% of our serotonin, which is a hormone that makes us happy, is produced. Okay, so if we're eating sugar, we're basically not feeding our happy bacteria. Yes. And the bacteria influence the way we think. There's a constant connection between our brain and our stomach. So if you eat a lot of sugar, those bacteria will create thoughts in your mind that are saying the following. I want sugar. I am tired. Give me something sweet. Give me something fat. But if you don't have as many of those bacteria there would be a stronger voice from the large intestine that is saying, hmm, I would like a salad right now. That feels nourishing for this system. Okay, so depending on which parts of our intestines gets food, it will send signals to our brain 
and we're basically teaching ourselves what to what to be what to want so if we're eating a lot of sugar we're basically feeding the sugar bacteria in the in the intestines in the colon exactly. not sure where it is and they become more and more of those ones yeah so when we then don't eat sugar there will be a lot of those bacteria who say we want sugar and that will be a powerful signal to the brain yes and exactly. if we instead would have eaten salad 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 we would have created a lot of salad bacteria in in our colon that would say we want more salad so you would want to eat more of that exactly and so that we're is kind why... of tricking ourselves into being sugar addicted yeah like you said addicted it becomes an addiction and uh, not only that sugar is causing the brain to release a lot of dopamine which is the motivation hormone and yeah. when you have heightened levels of dopamine a lot of the time because you're eating a lot of sugar and it's the same hormone you get from watching porn or taking drugs sugar releases dopamine uh, it's the same hormone that cocaine is releasing and when you have a lot of that often you get less receptors in your brain for dopamine and you need more and more of that to get the same well-being effect and it becomes an addictive circle just like cocaine okay that's a whole new loop of things let's see if i can wrap this up because mm -hmm. i've never talked as much about sugar in my life and <sighs> let's start with I like the analogy of the small and the big tank. Like we have this big fat reserve and if we were just running on that reserve all the time we would stay on this high level of energy and probably in a good mood for a long time. But instead we're running if we're eating sugar or carbohydrates we're running on a small tank which uh, will run dry and as soon as it's run dry we feel a big need of filling it otherwise we'll be crash in our energy or get grumpy or anything else which was a lot like me in 2016 we also learned that sugar causes uh, diabetes and what happens then is that we have eaten too much sugar over too long time and we've created insulin which is the hormone that takes sugar and turns it into fat and after a while our body has create, created so much insulin that we kind of stopped being able to turn sugar into fat or we kind of get immune to that reaction and that's just really bad for us and we also learned that there is tons and tons of sugar in uh, soda and we drink a lot of soda and we learned that we learned that sugar causes inflammation we didn't learn how though but we learned that it's caused inflammation and that inflammation is basically our body getting into fight or flight mode kind of uh, where all of our cells are kind of fighting or preparing to fight which drains off of the energy reduces our immune system which will ends up us being able to do less things and being sick more often so all in all sugar is just really bad for us so let's say we want to avoid sugar uh, what are like the most common sugar traps soda we said anything else well if you go to an american supermarket you will find sugar in most products there it's hidden in ketchup it's hidden in tomato sauce it's hidden in yogurt it's hidden in a lot of products have added sugar in it so read the back of the package watch out for things that are processed look at how much someone has been messing with your food and when you say messing what do you mean um, processing it okay so the more the more things that it's been through the more machines you imagine being part of this the more likely it is that they have added sugar yes exactly and then they add sugar to things because it makes it taste sweeter it makes it feed these sugar bacteria that we already have so it makes us more wanting that thing more because of the sugar and it creates an addictive loop that makes us want to buy more of that ketchup for example example Ex exactly i mean okay so we want to stay away from things that been to th 
through too many different steps that we imagine. I, I can just picture myself things that I've eaten a lot in my life where I didn't, I wouldn't have thought about it having a lot of sugar would be yogurt, as you mentioned, that that's probably a lot of sugar in yogurt. It's more than Coca-Cola, some yogurts. Wow. And milk, it's quite a lot of sugar in milk, right? Yeah. Is that good or bad sugar then? 5% of the sugar in uh, in milk. Um, it's the same sugar. Okay. So is there some other uh, candy, obviously, that's a given one. Uh, juice, that's a lot of sugar, right? That's, yeah, pure sugar. It's the same yeah. as Coca-Cola. So it's easy to think that orange juice is good for you because it's oranges, but it's actually just pure sugar. Yeah, because if you were eating those oranges in its natural state, you would maybe have to eat six oranges to get one glass of orange juice. And that takes quite a bit of time to do. And then you would have the fibers in there that would cause it to raise the blood sugar slowly, slower. Yeah. Okay, so stay away from... Well, maybe it's easier to say drink more water than it is to say drink less Coke and orange juice. Because I think that if you're just having water with your food, you're simply not going to drink Coke or orange juice with your food. Mm. So personally, I think it's easier to say do more of this than it is to say do less of this. And that it's easier to create a new habit that kind of rela- um, replaces a habit than it is to just try to stop drinking Coke, for example. I agree with that, for sure. Good. Okay. So today we learned sugar is bad for you and drink more water. Anything else you want to add to this? Yes. So you used the metaphor in the beginning of a big tank and a small tank. And we've been talking in the previous episode about getting into ketosis, a state where your body is using fat for fuel. There are a lot of societies like the Okinawa people in Japan and all of these zones around the world where people live very long lives. The blue zones. Blue zones, yeah. I didn't want to use a concept that people might not be uh, familiar to. So the people in Okinawa, I can't pronounce that name. And Okinawa is an island in Japan, right? Island in Japan, yeah. They don't eat a lot of fat. I read that they eat like 8% fat. But they also don't eat any food that is processed or is uh, causing the blood sugar to go up quick. So if you eat beans, for example, vegetable, yes, there are carbs in it, but it won't spike the blood sugar. So that is the important thing to stay away from. Don't eat things that is causing blood sugar variation. Your mood will be more stable, you will have better energy, and you will avoid a lot of problems later on. And food that impacts your blood sugar is mainly than processed things that have a lot of sugar in them. Yes. Or juice, for example, which is basically just taking all the sugar out of the oranges and turn it into a drink. Taking all the fiber out of it, yes. Yeah. Okay. I get a better understanding of why people ask me, where do you get all your energy from, Eric? Well, I eat fat. I don't drink juice much. I don't drink Coke much anymore yeah. i used to drink a lot of so if the average american drank half a liter of coke every day i think i beat the average american a couple of years ago mm. i think i had like very often i had one liter of coke in a day very mm. often and my breakfast was usually a slice of bread with a thick layer of peanut butter thick layer of nutella and bananas that's a lot of sugar too that's a lot of sugar mm, and i wonder fat, why i was grumpy and the fat that is in the peanuts we talked about eating bullet coffee before getting healthy fats in there but if you eat them together with sugar that will cause that fat to be stored in your fat cells and you will gain weight which now is we're, probably now the we're opposite. opening a whole new loop let's just do that in another episode okay <laughs> uh yeah you want to add something real quick otherwise i'll start summing up i feel finished with this sugar dialogue great then just leave it at that. So we're doing this podcast because we believe that entrepreneurship is the way to make the world a better place. And part of that is health. That a reason why I can do a lot of things is that I'm eating very well. And that's why we did this episode. And we want to build a community of people who wants to make a world a better place through entrepreneurship. And we want to teach you guys how to do that. 
And we want this podcast to reach as many ears and souls as possible. And one way to do that is to get you listening to this, to subscribe to this podcast and tell other people to subscribe to this podcast. Because what happens when you click subscribe is that it greatly increases our chances to go into the various top lists out there. Because they're usually not based on who have the most listeners. It's actually based on who have the most percentage of people choosing to subscribe. So even though we have a small podcast, if lots of you listening will choose to subscribe, we have a chance of getting into these top lists. So I'll end this note by saying, please subscribe to this podcast in your podcast app. And we'll see you next week. I want to add one thing <laughs> that I really want to say. Of and it's a are. sweet thing that is bringing me a lot of happiness. And that is the thought of removing all sweet things altogether might seem depressing. So something I have found out in the last two years that is that there are different kinds of sweeteners that is actually seems almost too good to be true. I'm a little bit skeptical about aspartame and the stuff that is in Cola Zero, but there are things like um, xylitol and erythrol, and what those things are is basically fermented fruit and birch syrup. So the sugar has been turned into a sugar alcohol, which has zero calories, is good for your teeth, it doesn't raise the blood sugar at all, and it's sweeter than sugar. And to me, it tastes kind of similar. So if you want to bake or you want to get some sweet in your diet, but you don't want to raise the blood sugar, I think those are very, very good options. You said don't remove stuff, replace it. Just take the sugar you're eating and replace it with erythrol or xylitol, and you will make a very good trade-off. And the best ways to find them is probably Google replacements for sugar and then try to find these words because they're really hard to spell. Yes, <laughs> erythrol and xylitol. You can buy them in most big supermarkets. Great. Thank you for this, Emil. Uh, I learned a lot about food that I didn't know before. Yes, Have sir. a lovely day. This was fun. See you next week. Cheers. Bye.